The use of the hyperbaric chamber has become much more commonplace in the United States over the last few years. The purpose of this tape is to acquaint doctors and medical personnel with just one aspect of uh, hyperbaric treatment, and this is the healing of wounds. There are a number of uh, conditions treated in the hyperbaric chamber, and I think we ought to define what hyperbaric oxygenation is. It's uh, breathing 100% oxygen in an environment of increased pressure. That means the patient has to be totally enclosed uh, in a chamber. This does not apply to uh, topical hyperbaric oxygen where just one limb is exposed to increased oxygen. Uh, there is not much uh, clinical uh, or scientific uh, data to, uh, to suggest that topical oxygen is of value in any of the diseases which uh, we're going to discuss. Uh, there are a number of things which can be treated in the chamber, and uh, here on this slide is a list of them. Uh, however, today we are only going to discuss the last five, uh, starting with osteomyelitis. Uh, before we do so, though, I think we ought to look at the kinds of hyperbaric equipment that are available and what their relative advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, first of all, we, we have to make a basic choice between the multiplace chamber and the monoplace chamber. Uh, as the name implies, multiplace means that more than one person can be put in the chamber at a time, uh, and the monoplace means a, a single uh, patient chamber. The multiplace chamber uh, has the advantage of having an attendant with the patient at all times. In other words, hands-on treatment is possible. You can also treat more patients at the same time in a multi-place chamber. In our particular facility here in Milwaukee, we can treat up to five patients uh, simultaneously uh, in relative comfort. Uh, additionally, uh, you can uh, do surgery if necessary, although the need for doing surgery in the chamber today is vanishingly small. Uh, minor uh, uh, adjustments of, of lines and so on, and uh, resuscitation, of course, can be carried out as well as suctioning. Um, all of these are advantages of the multi-place chamber, although the multi-place is much more expensive to install. Uh, here's a picture, uh, excuse the slant of the film, but here's a picture uh, showing patients uh, during an air break in the multi-place chamber. Uh, oxygen is delivered by mask or by head tent, or of course in the very seriously ill patient, uh, it can be delivered uh, by endotracheal tube. Uh, the uh, atmosphere of the multi-place chamber is air, uh, so as to reduce the explosion hazard, um, and uh, the patient receives oxygen only by mask. The monoplace chamber is uh, much cheaper, and it's an efficient way of delivering 100% oxygen. It is compressed directly from wall oxygen with 100% oxygen. It's cost-effective, and it's quite adaptable. Uh, this is a picture of a monoplace chamber. Uh, here, of course, it's impossible to suction a patient while they're inside, and one cannot give, quotes hands-on treatment, unquote, uh, however, about 90% of everything that can be done in the walk-in chamber can be uh, uh, accomplished uh, in the monoplace chamber. It is possible to introduce uh, uh, IV lines through the door and IVAC pumps can pump uh, uh, continuous intravenous infusions into patients during treatment. A bolus of medicine can be given as necessary. Monitoring can be carried out, both blood pressure, EKG, uh, or whatever. Arterial line can also be used in this, and one can externalize the arterial line to draw arterial samples if desired. Uh, this chamber is also fitted with a ventilator which fits inside the door, so even the apneic patient can be successfully managed in the monoplace chamber. Well, uh, having now at least covered the basics of the equipment, uh, let's look at what the mechanisms are. How does hyperbaric oxygen work? Now, as you remember, we're only going to concentrate on um, uh, five items uh, loosely associated as wound healing, with or without infection. Of course, osteomyelitis has infection. Uh, we're going to have to look on how, why, on why uh, greater amounts of oxygen would have an effect uh, on these various uh, categories. First of all, let's look at the amount of oxygen. Normally, the blood carries uh, 22 volumes per cent oxygen, all on the hemoglobin, or almost all of it on the hemoglobin, very little in physical solution, and uh, this is a relatively enormous amount of oxygen. The brain uses only about 6.1 volumes per cent per pass through the brain um, uh, of oxygen. And uh, if we look at this slide, we have a bunch of uh, O2s here, uh, quite a number of them. Uh, note here that uh, this is the amount of oxygen. This single O2 represents the amount of oxygen one gets normally at one atmosphere breathing room air. However, if we give 100% oxygen, 
uh, by mask or at the bedside uh, on the ward, one can uh, increase this uh, by a factor of five to 100% oxygen. Now, uh, that normally is the amount that one can give maximally. Uh, if we uh, go to three atmospheres absolute, however, for each additional atmosphere, we add five more of these O2 symbols. So you can see we can give roughly 15 times the amount of oxygen uh, to a patient in the chamber that we can at the, be at the bedside, uh, breathing air. Or, <clears throat> uh, well, this, this amount of oxygen is uh, not insignificant. Uh, the hemoglobin normally is 98% saturated, so we, we don't add very much to the hemoglobin. However, almost everything that we add goes into physical solution of the plasma, about 6.4 volumes per cent at three atmospheres, absolute. Well, you would say this isn't uh, a great amount of oxygen. Uh, can this make a difference? <clears throat> well, yes, it can. As we have mentioned already, uh, the brain only uses 6.1 volumes per cent, and so one is, uh, can sustain life in the complete absence of hemoglobin just by physically dissolved oxygen uh, at three atmospheres absolute. Normally, wound healing uh, treatment is carried out at less than three atmospheres. Uh, typically, it's two atmospheres in the monoplace. Uh, or 2.4 atmospheres in the walk-in chamber, um, or it could be at two atmospheres in the walk-in chamber also. This is up to uh, the individual uh, operator. The, the question is, uh, why uh, would um, this oxygen have uh, more effect, uh, seemingly greater effect than one would predict? Well, it's not only the amount of oxygen that we uh, put in, but it is also the pressure gradient that we supply. Uh, the amount of oxygen uh, is, uh, is constant in the plasma at a certain pressure, but uh, when it is uh, forced away from the capillary, uh, the distances can be tripled or quadrupled. And when one is dealing with a wound which is ischemic and where the capillaries are sparse, uh, one can support tissue and cause uh, increased healing uh, with uh, just a modest increases of oxygen if the diffusion gradient is large enough, which it is, of course, under hyperbaric conditions. The mechanisms, well, we have hyperoxygenation here, obviously, is what we're talking about. The diffusion gradient we've discussed, it's vastly Im increased. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen seems to promote neovascularization, but there's more to it than just simply it makes new blood vessels. Uh, that's a complex process, and we'll deal with that later. Vasoconstriction always occurs. It's a defense mechanism of the body. Uh, there's an antimicrobial technique uh, uh, effect, which we'll deal with a little bit. Bubble reduction, of course, is important when treating diving diseases, and we shan't uh, deal with that further here. It does not have relevance for uh, wound healing. Uh, Osteomyelitis uh, is uh, successfully treated by a, a group of these uh, characteristics. Uh, toxin inhibition uh, is, again, something we will not deal with as that does not have much effect here. Scar reduction uh, can be uh, a side effect. When we put someone in a hyperbaric chamber, uh, and uh, increase the pressure. Very, uh, the, the oxygen in the bloodstream goes up very rapidly. You'll see here from this dotted line, uh, this represents uh, the arterial uh, blood uh, and venous blood, essentially. Uh, when one goes to two atmospheres, within a very short period of time, the blood uh, is equilibrated with the new pressure. But on coming out of the chamber, the amount of oxygen in the blood drops precipitously. So one would predict that, well, uh, the uh, uh, effect of hyperbaric oxygen cannot be very long-lasting because uh, lo look at what happens to uh, the oxygen levels in the blood. However, George Hart at Long Beach Memorial Hospital did some studies uh, using uh, uh, electrodes uh, placed into muscle and subcutaneous tissue and discovered that the muscle uh, oxygen dropped much more slowly uh, after the patient is removed from the chamber and the uh, subcutaneous oxygen drops uh, even more slowly. Uh, these are important points to remember. So it would appear that uh, significant effects uh, can be found um, uh, up to uh, four hours, uh, even though the patient may be in the tre treatment chamber only an hour and a half. Uh, it's a good thing here to mention that hyperbaric oxygen is not a panacea. It's uh, just uh, one aspect of uh, getting the patient well and healing an ulcer. 
Uh, there are a great many things such as growth factors derived from platelets and macrophages which are terribly important to the healing of a wound and we'll discuss those uh, shortly. I would also like to point out that what is dead is dead. Uh, a patient referred for salvage of a tissue flap that has gone on to complete uh, vascular occlusion and is beginning to necrose. Uh, this uh, is uh, something that cannot be saved with any amount of hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, we must deal with living tissue and not with, some, not with something which has uh, gone beyond health. With the exception of uh, infectious processes, uh, hyperbaric oxygen when it comes to wound healing is useful only when the wound is gaping or is ischemic. In other words, uh, if there is enough oxygen or enough blood supply uh, to a wound under normal circumstances, it will heal by itself. Hyperbaric oxygen can only supply more oxygen and it cannot supply the other factors required for wound healing. Uh, the effects of the hyperbaric chamber are basically three, and they're very simple. Mechanical compression, and this only applies to gas phase bubbles. Uh, for example, uh, if one has decompression sickness and one has bubbles in the tissues and blood vessels, uh, putting a person in the hyperbaric chamber will make the bubbles smaller. However, when it comes to soft tissue or liquids or solids, uh, mechanical compression does not occur. There is no change uh, by putting the person in the chamber. Uh, what we are most interested in is the PO2. In other words, can we raise uh, the level of oxygen to normal in ischemic tissue? And in certain uh, instances, we would like to raise the amount of oxygen present to greater than normal levels. And these are the only things we can do with the hyperbaric chamber. The chamber will do nothing else. And we have to predicate all of our, our, uh, our, our theories on uh, simply what a raised PO2 will do. And the limits of that physiology are the limits of the hyperbaric chamber's healing properties. Uh, first of all, oxygen is toxic. Uh, and uh, it causes a vasoconstriction, a profound vasoconstriction, every time someone breathes it under pressure. Uh, at two atmospheres absolute, there is a decrease in blood flow of about 20% in muscle. Uh, now, this does not decrease oxygen supply. Remember, uh, we have a 20% uh, decrease in blood flow, but we have 15 times the amount of oxygen dissolved physically in the plasma, so there's a net gain, a vast net gain in oxygen supply to the tissues, despite vasoconstriction. When the level of oxygen in the tissues reaches 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, uh, a number of things begin to happen. And I use 30 to 40 because this is the level that Mother Nature likes. Um, if we go much higher than that, uh, we're not really causing any, uh, we're not helping any, because uh, in, in the normal state of affairs, 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury is, is adequate and uh, for, uh, for healing. Mother Nature uh, has given over some two million years of very expensive R&D into this, and 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury is what's required. Uh, at, 30, at beginning at 30 millimeters of mercury, the leukocytes can kill bacteria. Uh, somewhat lower than that, uh, a little bit lower, uh, at 20 millimeters of mercury, the fibro uh, fibroblast growth begins, but it's better at 30. Uh, fibroblasts, of course, produce collagen, and when they subdivide, they produce the matrix of which scar is uh, made and uh, wound is healed. Uh, returning to number one here, leukocytes uh, do uh, gain the ability to kill at 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. They have an oxidative process called the respiratory burst which kills uh, microorganisms. Uh, they do this uh, starting at 30 millimeters of mercury. Uh, of interest is that much higher PO2s can make this more effective. We will look at this later. This is an unusual uh, uh, event in nature. <clears throat> We've discussed this. Uh, I just can't emphasize it enough. 30 to 40 tor is what's required for uh, phagocytosis. And the intermittent raising of PO2 stimulates collagen and fibroblast activity. The first word here is a very key one, intermittent. If we were to continuously expose someone to hyperbaric oxygen without any breaks, we probably would not see wound healing. And uh, this phenomenon is something we really should uh, discuss now. The process of wound healing begins 
uh, when the body discovers there's been a break in the integument or in the tissue, platelets arrive on the scene, and these platelets are loaded with something uh, called uh, wound healing factors. Uh, the cells are, uh, uh, that will heal the wound are relatively uh, uninformed. They don't know what to do, but there are mitogens, uh, which are short chain proteins, which cause the cells to differentiate in certain ways to, to lay down new blood vessels, to uh, make uh, uh, fibroblasts, and so on. Uh, and these are, are, are stimulated or carried along in the platelets that immediately arrive at the wound. However, uh, the platelet action is short lived. Uh, the uh, macrophage. Uh, comes on the scene later, and the macrophage is a factory that makes these mitogens. And uh, what's more uh, important is the anoxic macrophage is stimulated to produce the uh, juice, if you will, that helps make new capillaries. If the macrophage is not anoxic, it will not produce the necessary mitogens to revascularize the area. Now, uh, it's paradoxical that we're dealing here with hyperbaric oxygen, and we're giving plenty of oxygen so that the macrophages cannot very well be hypoxic when we have them in the chamber, and that's absolutely correct, and they do not produce mitogens to make new vessels while the patient is in the hyperbaric chamber. However, because the exposure is intermittent, uh, let's say we expose someone for two hours uh, uh, once a day uh, for hyperbaric treatment. For the remaining 22 hours, remember the blood level comes down very quickly uh, to normal after treatment. Uh, and if we're talking about macrophages present in the tissues of subcutaneous uh, areas, uh, within uh, four hours of the beginning of the hyperbaric treatment, we're down to normal levels and we're starting to become hypoxic again. Uh, we have probably 20 hours of hypoxic stimulation every day to produce the mitogens that uh, stimulate uh, the new blood vessels. Now, when we put them in the chamber, we raise the level in the wound to at least 20 to 30, or hopefully 40 millimeters of mercury, and now uh, the uh, fibroblasts can go ahead and produce, and produce collagen. So when we can produce collagen, again, because of the gradient of oxygen way out ahead of capillary buds, the capillaries can now move in to uh, this uh, rich goo uh, of collagen and to begin to form new arcades. In other words, uh, the hypoxic macrophage stimulates new capillary formation, but new capillaries, when they move along, uh, cannot move out and just swing in the breeze. They have to move out into something. Okay, the hyperbaric period uh, produces lots of collagen ahead of the capillaries so that the capillaries can now invade this area and form new arcades more rapidly. So it's a kind of a push-pull technique uh, and only the intermittency of hyperbaric oxygen permits this state of affairs. Just to emphasize again, the cellular repair does not occur because of fibroblast sensitivity to low oxygen at less than 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. And uh, in areas of injury uh, where we have this hypoxia, uh, neovascularization is uh, accelerated. And this is just a graphic depiction of what we've already uh, been talking about. Uh, can we measure this uh, in any way? Well, uh, Smith Ketchum, in, uh, Smith -Ketchum in, in San Francisco in 1968 did some interesting studies where he made a standard burn wound on the back of a rat. And then he treated half of the rats in the hyperbaric chamber and half were left in the, con in the cage as controls. Uh, some days later, he sacrificed the rats and injected them with Schlesinger mass, uh, which is a radio-opaque substance. So he added some heparin solution to be sure that this material got out into the distal vasculature. And he produced a uh, microangiogram, if you will. This is a normal rat back, uh, and you can see the uh, architecture here of the, of the vascularity. The... Uh, Next thing he did was to, to take uh, the rats who'd been burned uh, and to uh, uh, sacrifice them at various periods of time after burning. And uh, here we see 
uh, uh, rats that were sacrificed 18 days post-burn. You can see here on the right the hyperbarically treated rat and on the left the control rat. Note the vast difference in vascularity. Uh, this, uh, again, is two rats uh, at 20 days post-burn. On the right is the hyperbaric run. On the left is the control. And this is at 22 days post-burn, uh, the hyperbaric on the right and the control on the left. Roy Myers, uh, had, working with some other investigators at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, used a guinea pig model to determine uh, what effect hyperbaric oxygen would have on healing. Uh, this is a very standard model of a flap, which is known to necrose, for example. Uh, the flap will normally heal uh, this way with about half of it necrosing. Uh, more than just looking visually, they were interested in the biochemical changes that occurred. Uh, and so these guinea pigs had the areas of the flaps uh, analyzed. Uh, here we see the glucose uh, measurement in the tissue, the dotted line indicates the uh, glucose uh, level uh, in the hyperbarically treated animal, and the solid line indicates the control. Note that six and a half centimeters out from the uh, base of the pedicle, there is a greater amount of glucose present than in the control. Uh, conversely, the lactate level uh, was also uh, changed. Uh, here you see the lactate level is much higher in the control and much uh, lower in the hyperbarically treated animal. Uh, why was this? In other words, how did that glucose get out there to the, uh, uh, to the tissue? And how was lactate taken away? Uh, the answer was found here where they looked at the extent of capillary distribution beyond the epidermal necrosis. And here you can see uh, the uh, 76 um, microns uh, versus 204 microns uh, of capillary growth, uh, uh, 204 microns in the hyperically treated uh, animal. Uh, we had many more capillaries available, and uh, this is why uh, more, more glucose could get there and more lactate could be taken away. This is another example of neovascularization in the hyperbarically treated animal. The p-values are very significant, you'll notice, um, 0 0.05, uh, however, uh, in, the, uh, in the capillary distance. Now, uh, all this is very good, but uh, we had to achieve some uh, degree of control over hyperbaric treatment. Uh, a lot of people were being treated in chambers for things which uh, were not irrelevant, really. Uh, they were being treated uh, by physicians who did not understand the physiology of hyperbaric oxygen, and uh, much too much was expected from this form of treatment. Uh, because there were some abuses and a number of excesses, the Undersea Medical Society, now called the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society, uh, established a committee on hyperbaric oxygen uh, in 1976. Uh, I was made chairman of that committee, and we investigated some 64 different disorders which had been touted to improve in the hyperbaric chamber. Some of them were uh, completely out of line, uh, breast firming enlargement, re removing skin wrinkles, changing hair color, and so on. However, we looked at, uh, the, uh, looked at these very, very critically and came up with a very much shortened list of things which we felt were legitimate. Uh, we talked to Medicare, Healthcare Finances Administration, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield during the process of coming up with this uh, report. And uh, it was finally accepted by the Executive Committee of the Undersea Medical Society, and uh, then uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield accepted it in toto uh, on September 14, 1977. Since that time, Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield has used uh, the UMS committee report as a source document. Uh, the report has been updated uh, almost yearly, and uh, uh, the most recent edition is uh, the 1986 edition. Let us now look at some of the specific diseases that can be treated with hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, we'll begin with chronic uh, osteomyelitis. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that uh, hyperbaric oxygen helps greatly. Uh, first of all, just having to do with osteogenesis, we see that as oxygen pressure increases, uh, there is more of a tendency to form bone, whereas at low uh, O2 levels, uh, uh, cartilage uh, is the chief uh, product of uh, osteoblastic activity. We 
uh, find that this is a parallel with what happens, of course, in the, in the actual uh, normal situation where hyperbaric oxygen is not a factor. After a fracture, there will be low O2 uh, in the area of the wound and cartilage and callus are formed, which later become hardened into bone as uh, more vascularity is established in the area of the fracture. However, the biggest problem in osteomyelitis is infection. And uh, the question number one is, can we raise the level of oxygen in the osteomyelitic wound high enough to be meaningful? Uh, John Mater at Galveston had done, has done some very uh, basic studies uh, using uh, the rabbit model. And at one atmosphere, um, he discovered that uh, infected animals had a uh, 21 millimeter mercury partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the area of the infection. Non-infected animals in the rabbit, it was uh, 45 millimeters of mercury. <clears throat> now under hyperbaric conditions, um, uh, you, you can see there was a, an immense change here. We got to 104 millimeters of mercury. Uh, that's higher than 30 to 40, but that's not bad. We're going to look at uh, why that isn't bad. As a matter of fact, why it's useful. Non-infected animals, of course, went sky high, uh, 321 millimeters of mercury. Note that the infected animals uh, had PO2s below 30 millimeters of mercury, which indicates their white cells really weren't doing much of anything. Now, this complicated looking slide here uh, really is to uh, show uh, what happens with uh, uh, bacterial growth, in this case, uh, Staph aureus. Uh, along the bottom here, you'll see that uh, this is a two hour period of time and uh, on the side going up, you'll see that that's the number of organisms, the staph or, uh, aureus organisms uh, in the culture. This is an in vitro study where he dumped a bunch of uh, staph aureus bugs into some broth and watched them grow under various conditions. And uh, we'll note that uh, they all started 100% of the inoculum uh, where uh, he did not have uh, white, uh, white cells in the inoculum. You'll note that here the, the line goes up, uh, the number of organisms increased over two hours, uh, especially um, uh, then, then where he had uh, no opsonin um, in the, uh, well, he had opsonin, but no uh, white cells. Again, there was an increase. Uh, what's necessary for uh, killing organisms is uh, white cells plus opsonin, and then killing can progress. Uh, now, the lower uh, four lines which go down show what happens under different tensions of oxygen. The upper line there shows 23 millimeters of mercury. Uh, you can see that there wasn't much uh, reduction of uh, organism count or colony count at the end of two hours. As a matter of fact, it started to rise again. At 45 millimeters of mercury, we uh, killed off about 40% of the organisms uh, because there was enough oxygen for the white cells to do their thing. At 109 millimeters of mercury, the uh, was even a greater kill rate, a 50% kill rate. And at 150 millimeters of mercury, uh, over 70% of the organisms uh, in broth were killed by the Staph aureus. Now this is a very unusual slide because normally uh, you could never achieve 150 millimeters of mercury in nature uh, in any wound breathing air. Yet here, where we have a, had a greatly increased amount of oxygen, the white cells killed better. And this is almost like trying to paint a lily or gild refined in gold. Uh, uh, Mother Nature just does not uh, let you tinker with her very well. In other words, if you try to improve on her, you're usually doomed to failure. But here we have a situation which is totally artificial, where the white cells are killing more efficiently uh, at pressures of oxygen much greater than would ever be expected in nature. All right, well, we know that in hyperbaric, under hyperbaric conditions, we can get uh, partial pressures of oxygen, at least from the rabbit studies, in infected bone, up over 100 uh, millimeters of mercury. Now, chronic osteomyelitis, uh, there are no cr exact criteria which uh, uh, you can use. And I think perhaps uh, the most useful uh, way to put it is if you have an initial episode, it's acute, and you, uh, you treat it with antibiotics and it gets better, that's fine. That's acute osteomyelitis. If it ever comes back, then you call it chronic. Uh, macronecrosis and necrosis of large areas is kind of the hallmark of the disease. And I, in other words, you have a loose pieces of bone in there, 
uh, is sequestrum in Belucrum, you have uh, hardening or scarring of the bones, which is sclerosis, and you may or may not have a sinus tract uh, present. Uh, chronic osteomyelitis is something we never say cure with because you may have uh, a period of uh, 10 years disease-free only to have recurrence at 12 years. So uh, even uh, uh, very optimistic orthopedists uh, will only say, well, we arrest uh, an osteomyelitis or we have a remission, but we will not use the word cure. There is a poor correlation between what you culture out of the sinus tract. That's the only purpose of this slide. Uh, if you want to really find out what's growing in, or, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an osteomyelitis, then you've really got to go and, and get a piece of bone and culture that. That will tell you what's growing. Don't just use a swab of the sinus tract. This is typical fool's paradise if you think you know what the bug is after doing that. We use a clinical staging system because, uh, for obvious reasons, it looks, it, we can tell who we should treat, and it provides a basis for comparing various treatment protocols. Uh, we don't treat every case of osteomyelitis. Uh, the vast majority of them will heal just fine with surgery and antibiotics. What we're interested in is the case that will not heal or has recurred, has become the chronic case. There are exceptions to this. For example, in a severely compromised host where, uh, uh, um, say, a, a severe diabetic with a PO2 measured in the foot of uh, less than 15, where over a period of two weeks bone involvement is already evident on x-ray, uh, this person uh, is going to be in for a very bad uh, course unless something drastic is done. Under these, these situations, we might treat acutely. The other uh, two situations where acute treatment is permitted by the Undersea Medical, Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society Committee on Hyperbaric Oxygenation. It's when you have osteomyelitis of the sinuses, bones of the skull in other words, or uh, the sternum. The reason for bones of the skull is uh, if you don't do something there, you may end up with a very disfiguring situation, for example, the bones of the face, or because of the proximity to the central nervous system, you might very well end up with a meningitis. So trying to put the fire out as quickly as possible when the osteomyelitis is present in the skull is justified. Uh, similarly with the sternum, these are extraordinarily difficult cases to treat because of the constant movement of the sternum during breathing, and uh, these are eligible for immediate treatment when diagnosed. We use the classification system pioneered by Mater uh, and others. Uh, uh, Cherney actually uh, was the one who initiated uh, this. Mater has, has popularized it down at Galveston. It's uh, an anatomic stage and a physiologic stage you look at. Anatomically, medullary osteomyelitis is a stage one. Typically, that's hematogenous, superficial osteo. That's uh, on the outside of the bone versus the inside of the bone. Uh, it can be uh, localized or it can be a diffuse. Uh, diffuse osteos are very difficult to manage. The physiologic stage, uh, the normal host, there's nothing wrong with the, uh, the host. Uh, healthy young 18-year-old with uh, osteo of the tibia, for example, would be a normal host. Uh, a B host has some form of systemic or local compromise. Now, for example, the diabetic would be a B host. Um, and that would be a systemic compromise. So someone who is malnutrition. Uh, or some other infectious disease or uh, systemic disease would, uh, or on steroids, for example, would be a systemic compromise. A local compromise would be someone who's had seven operations in that area to remove uh, a dead bone, has uh, immense scarring, and cannot seem to heal the area because the blood supply has been too sclerosed. Uh, this would be a local compromise. Uh, or perhaps even someone with a localized uh, placking of, of an arteriosclerotic nature. It would be hard to make a distinction there between a systemic and a local compromise, but you get the idea. A C host, that's someone where the treatment is worse than the disease. In other words, uh, if you look at an x-ray and find the entire tibia is uh, just riddled from one end to the other, and the only treatment would be to remove the intibia, uh, then uh, you would have to say, well, what's, what's worse, uh, changing a Band-Aid locally uh, once uh, a day or removing uh, the person's leg? Um, these are pictures of a patient that we had uh, who had gone over a cliff on a bulldozer in a quarry 12 years before and had crushed the entire lower half of his body. He was in the hospital for three years with multiple draining sinuses from osteomyelitis, finally got out with one draining sinus. 
which popped open and drained pus every two weeks. Uh, we got him, uh, as I say, 12 years later. He'd had no surgery for nine years. He was on no antibiotics at that time, so we had a, a virgin case. And uh, we agreed with the insurance company uh, to treat him if we could do a computerized bone scan before and after. We changed nothing else. We added no antibiotics, no nothing. And then we just put him in the chamber 20 times. Now, this is a picture from the computerized bone scan uh, before and after 20 treatments. You'll note here that uh, there is not much uh, uh, glow. Each of the little dots on this uh, matrix here represents a specified number of counts. Uh, before treatment, but here you see there's quite a bit of uh, radiation activity after 20 treatments. Uh, the reason for this is neovascularization. We uh, advanced new capillaries into this area. Uh, the patient, incidentally, after 20, 20 additional treatments, uh, went on to heal and uh, has uh, not uh, had to return for further treatment. And that was uh, uh, over uh, 10 years ago. This is a young uh, boy who had an acute osteomyelitis, but it was not responding to anything. 11 years old, he was stuck in the knee by a pitchfork. Uh, eventually turned out to have osteo of the proximal uh, met uh, uh, metaphyseal plate. Uh, he was treated vigorously with an IV antibiotics in the hospital, and here you can see uh, the date here, 921 uh, of 73. This is uh, 14 years ago. Uh, he was in the hospital. You can see here segmented cells versus lymphs that uh, he was fighting a bacterial infection. And normally in an 11-year-old, uh, there'll be about a 50-50 distribution of uh, segs and lymphs. Uh, he was finally discharged from the hospital after spiking daily temps and uh, going downhill in terms of, of uh, not making his own blood. Uh, sent home on iron and bed rest, uh, got no better. Uh, we uh, put him in the chamber after a two-week hiatus and gave him 20 hyperbaric treatments. You'll see here the difference uh, in the change in his hemogram. Uh, this is the same boy, same time frame, and you'll note here that he was becoming uh, anemic uh, because he wasn't making his own blood. They would give him a transfusion, it would drop, a transfusion would drop. We put him in the chamber, he started making his own blood again. Uh, when we got him, his uh, albumin-globulin ratio, AG ratio, was, uh, was reversed. Uh, and here you see after 20 treatments, it came back to the normal area, area very quickly. And finally, his uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, the sed rate was elevated to a maximum of 120. We got him at 115. He dropped uh, almost like a stone uh, while he was in the chamber. Uh, for 20 treatments. That was on an outpatient basis. He just came in once every five days. We gave him weekends off. He read a comic book for two hours in the chamber while breathing oxygen by a mask, and that was his only treatment. After 20 treatments, uh, his uh, infection subsided, uh, the swelling on the knee went down, and he went out kicking a football with the other kids. Uh, that was uh, 13 years ago, and uh, he is uh, now uh, well. Uh, here's a woman uh, with uh, another complication of, uh, of a hip fracture. She had a prosthesis inserted, a total hip, uh, and uh, some uh, weeks afterwards developed uh, an infected prosthesis. Uh, here you see the little dark area indicating where the activity is. This is a normal bone scan. Uh, she was referred in by an orthopedist whose only option at this point was to remove the prosthesis entirely, take off the top of the femur, and leave her with a um, girdle stone revision, uh, which uh, takes the uh, severed head of the femur and uh, that is jammed into the acetabulum on which the patient walks. Uh, not wishing to do that, we submitted her to 20 uh, hyperbaric treatments and uh, we got a very hot looking scan the next time we looked, but the, uh, the localized hot area is gone and the woman's fever disappeared, her pain disappeared, and she started walking up steps normally. Uh, she did not recur. Uh, a word of caution here, this will only work about half of the time uh, when you have an infected prosthesis. You must get these early. And if the prosthesis is mobile, in other words, if you get a positive windshield wiper sign on fluoroscopy, if the prosthesis is moving within the shaft of the femur, uh, there's no point in bothering to, to treat uh, hyperbarically. Now, uh, a very useful, a good study was done by Davis et al. Uh, down in San Antonio where they followed up uh, patients for a, a good number of years. This was just published in 1986. They took 38 patients with proven osteomyelitis unresponsive to conventional therapy. And these patients now were well studied. We knew exactly, in other words, we know exactly what these patients had. 
Sadly, this paper was reworked some three times before it was accepted by the Journal of Bolton and Joint Surgery, so we know that all of these uh, details were carefully documented. Uh, the patients all had local debridement, parenteral antibiotics, and hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, in addition to the culture-specific antibiotics, they averaged 48 hyperbaric treatments. And here's an important point, highly coordinated medical and surgical care. 34 out of 38 of these patients were disease-free at the end of 30, uh, uh, well, at the end of treatment, and they remained that way for, for 34 months on the average, whereas only four of 38 had been free of signs or symptoms for three months during the entire, or the 24 months prior to the initiation of hyperbaric oxygen. Now, the bottom line here, the important point is that 30 of these 34 who got to be disease-free remained disease-free for 7.5 to 10 years. This is phenomenal because uh, that kind of percentage has not been achieved in other studies. And we think that the reason that we're getting these long disease-free intervals is because of the neovascularization, which no other form of therapy apparently is providing. Uh, so the conclusions are very conservative. Davis uh, did not go out on a limb. He just said it appears to prolong infection-free interval. Well, 30 uh, out of 34 patients for up to 10 years, that's, that's a pretty good pr prolongation. I'd say almost it looks like he might have eradicated it. Uh, and he says success is not dependent upon a multi, uh, is dependent upon a multidisciplinary approach, but not on a single entity. Well, that's true, but you know, and the only other thing here is that hyperbaric had never been added to this patient's protocols before. Now, I would like to talk about uh, another uh, area uh, where we could perhaps uh, cure patients who have been previously difficult, and this is in the area of diabetes. You know, here we have a disease where small vessels, or the lack of them, is really the main problem. Uh, and if we have a means of making new blood vessels, new capillaries, as we've seen before from the scientific uh, studies, uh, maybe we could cure diabetes uh, problems in terms of peripheral vascular disease. Well, here we have a diabetic foot. Uh, and we'll put, him in, put the patient in the hyperbaric chamber, and wow, look at that. After uh, a few weeks of hyperbaric treatment, all healed up, previously hadn't been healing at all. Well, that's great. Let's go and empty out the hospitals now. Okay, here's a uh, patient with a diabetic ulcer on the foot. Uh, 2nd of June, uh, here we go to the uh, oh, same patient, 1st of July, uh, uh, here we go to the 29th of July. Uh, it doesn't look like we're getting anywhere. What's happening? I'm very disappointed. Yeah, uh, not every patient is going to respond. You have to work these patients up, and we'll, we'll discuss just how we do this. The metabolic workup will include a, a glycosylated uh, uh, hemoglobin, uh, thyroid, nutritional, nutritional status has got to be looked at. Uh, and then, very importantly, the uh, vascular testing, uh, which includes uh, the non-invasive part would be uh, Doppler uh, and TCPO2, the transcutaneous oxygen levels in the tissues measured transcutaneously, and of course the angiography. Uh, if you don't have big, large vessels, you're not going to be able to make small vessels distal to those blocked large vessels. You've got to uh, see to it that everything can be done to establish large vessel flow first. Then you look at infection assessment, including uh, x-ray, bone scan, white sc uh, uh, WBC scan, tagged indigo uh, indium scan, uh, biopsies were necessary. Sometimes you use CT scanning, especially with sternal osteos. Uh, and then we look at very carefully at the host factors that we discussed earlier. Uh, is the person on steroids and so on. Uh, when all of this is, uh, is, is looked at and the patient looks like they may be a candidate for hyperbaric, then we'll go ahead with treatment. But maintaining uh, good wound care at all times, plus maintaining good metabolic control, nutrition, and so on, that's all terribly important. Host factors, uh, lymphedema, of course, venous stasis, uh, we've already mentioned the major vessel disease, which is the sine qua non. You've got to have major vessels. Arteritis, we've treated patients successfully with this. Extensive scarring, radiation fibrosis, age, renal problems, diabetes, malignancy, hypoxia from lungs, uh, bad lungs, uh, immune deficiency, malnutrition, and so on. Uh, all of these things uh, have to be either corrected or overcome. 
The transcutaneous oxygen is a very important measuring tool. Uh, here it is on someone's foot, uh, a close-up of the same thing. And this is the box. We use a radiometer, but uh, Novometrix is an excellent machine also. They all work about the same. Um, we like to see transcutaneous PO2s above 40, but we often treat patients uh, who start out uh, with uh, transcutaneous PO2s of less than 15. This particular machine, or any of the machines, uh, really is not good for quantitating, but best, best for uh, indicating trends. Uh, if, if you treat and, and measure from week to week and you see that you're trending up, uh, then you know you're doing something for the patient, even though the wound may not appear to change much during the first week or so. If you see a change in the PO2 measured adjacent to the wound, you know that you're doing something to the tissue. We often see this occurring. There may be periods of plateau during a course of treatment where it'll go up for a while, then plateau, and then go up again. This is to be expected. Uh, it is very hard to get uh, uniform readings uh, consistently on these patients. At least quantitatively, we have been much disappointed in trying to predict just from the, what the initial level is whether or not the patient will heal. Uh, Buckley worked out a system of identifying uh, critical vascular pressures. Uh, the most important thing here in the diabetic is that if you do a Doppler ankle pressure, uh, blood pressure, uh, if it's less than 75 millimeters of mercury at the ankle, it uh, is unlikely that the patient will heal even with hyperbaric oxygen. This doesn't mean they can't, but it's unlikely. Uh, in the non-diabetic, the key uh, pressure is about 55 millimeters of mercury. Um, these uh, results were gleaned from 102 patients, uh, 42 of them non-diabetic and, and 62 diabetic. A very interesting study was done uh, by Mackey uh, and his group at in Boston, uh, where they looked at the cost of amputation and uh, they also looked at the cost of rebuilding uh, uh, the vascularity of these, of these limbs that were uh, about to be amputated. And uh, they took 106 patients, they followed them up to five years. Uh, they, uh, some were amputated, some had vascular reconstruction. Um, they uh, had 78 which underwent primary surgical vascular reconstruction, 28 had primary amputation, 34 reconstruction patients went on to fail and were amputated, and uh, 44 reconstructed patients healed. Okay, well, so you say, what, well, so what? Uh, you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah, well, what's most important here was that uh, Mackey and his group looked at costs. Uh, successful revascularization cost $28,000. Primary amputation cost $40,000 when you figure it in the rehab costs. And failed reconstruction cost $56,000 because you had to add, add the cost of amputation. And 50% of the cost resulted from daily room charges. Now, uh, the only thing we're kind of interested in here, we don't want to see anybody amputated, but if you say, well, it's a it's a really cheap way to go if you, you know, you don't want to go through days and weeks of possible revascularization, hyperbaric. Why don't we just take it off and end the problem? That you're looking at a cost of $40,000. You're looking at the cost of a typical hyperbaric oxygen run, it may be $10,000, $12,000. So that's very little compared to amputation. Chopping off the problem is not the optimal choice often. Baroni et al. did a study of diabetic uh, patients who had gangrenous or pregangrenous changes on their legs, and uh, he matched them. Uh, there were 18 patients with uh, uh, typical changes, retinopathy, etc., of uh, diabetes, had gangrenous uh, feet, treated with uh, wound care, debris, mon tight di diabetic control, and daily hyperbaric. There were 10 control patients. The way the control patients were chosen is that uh, they were all part of the same group, but 10 uh, of these patients refused to go in the hyperbaric chamber because it was too confining. Uh, but they received all the same uh, treatment as the, uh, as the other group, as the hyperbaric group. Um, they were carefully matched. Uh, her age, duration of illness, size, depth of lesions, presence of infection, diabetic control, and so on. Uh, the statistics on this were excellent. There were 16 out of the 18 hyperbaric patients uh, were healed, and only one out of the 10 were healed of the controls. The p-value was 0 
and uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a definitive study, although the numbers are small, the p-values were excellent. Uh, finally, there's other categories of limb salvage. Uh, this particular little girl had some intra-arterial penicillin uh, put into her uh, uh, leg by mistake uh, when she was getting an injection in the thigh. Her foot looked like it would uh, fall off, so that she was taken to the hyperbaric chamber here. We treated her very vigorously over a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, she ended up with excellent salvage of the, of the foot, and uh, two years later, the only thing discernible that was abnormal about the foot was that she had two tips of the, the second and third toes. The toe pads were not quite as full as on the contralateral side. I'd like to deal now with skin ulcers. A decubitus ulcer looks like it might be as a gaping wound, certainly, probably ischemic due to pressure. Uh, yes, we have treated these. Uh, this is uh, a patient uh, with a large decubitus due to poor nursing care. She was cared for at home. Uh, after eight months, someone turned her over and discovered that opening there. She was treated in the hyperbaric chamber. You can see in two weeks, we had cleaned this up considerably. The infection was stopped. Uh, it was very much cleaner at the end of one month. And uh, here, uh, we've already, the surgeons have already been at work and uh, are, you can see that there are tracks over here. Now, at this point, it's, an, it's an necessary to swing a flap. Could we close this uh, by continuing with hyperbaric oxygen? Uh, I suppose so, but let me show you another slide here. This is another decubitus. You see a whole body spike here and the date you'll notice uh, November 20th. Uh, we treated the patient vigorously. Here is uh, two months later. And uh, now you can see a tremendous area of healing, but note that the ulcer is still there. It is not cost effective to treat decubitus ulcers to closure with hyperbaric oxygen. Matter of fact, hyperbaric oxygen is not, uh, is, it's not an indication for HBO. It's not listed uh, in the indicated list. What we use it for only is a preparation for a graft. We would never do this again. We would only use it for a week or two, get a good graft base, and then a, a flap would be swung to close this. Let's go on now to skin flaps and grafts. Um, uh, split thickness grafting is the most common type that's done. Perrins did a study in England some years ago where he found that there was a 28% greater take in hyperbarically treated patients as compared to controls when using the split thickness graft. Of more importance was that 64% of the hyperbarically treated group had 90 to 100% take versus only 17% of the controls. That meant that there was no necessity for regrafting to, uh, to finally close. These were compromised patients. Here's an example. Uh, this patient has severe arthritis with an accompanying vasculitis or arteritis. And uh, the surgeon here was about to remove one more ray. He felt uh, that uh, it was impossible to close this. He treated this thing vigorously, but it wasn't healing up. Notice the yellow uh, avascular base of this ulcer, again, due to an arteritis. We started treating this patient on the 12th of November. And uh, here by the 21st, you'll see the base of the ulcer now is red, not yellow. We're getting some vascularity in here. Uh, the edges, don't worry about those. They'll clean up. And as you see, they have. Uh, this is by the 4th of December. He's now ready for grafting. Uh, the surgeon was reluctant to put a split thickness on here, saying it would fall off like a sheet of newspaper because of the patient's underlying a uh, vascular problem, his arter arteritis. But we prevailed on him just to do it. It'd be a simple procedure. So he did. And uh, this is a 21-month follow-up. Uh, the patient had complete take of the graft, a very satisfied customer, despite the arteritis. So hyperbaric oxygen was able to help this man considerably. Uh, this uh, boy fell uh, off his motorcycle uh, after being hit by a bus, uh, as well as having the kickstand uh, erect and uh, jam into his chest, severing his pulmonary artery. He landed unconscious on the red-hot muffler with his face. This is what burned his face, and uh, he also had burns on the chest. He had uh, eventually a pneumonectomy to save him from hemorrhaging uh, in, a, in a hospital near the scene. Uh, but when the uh, plastic surgeon tried grafting his face, the graft sloughed uh, from around his eye. Uh, he was put in the chamber, uh, and he got, as a result, 100% uh, take of the grafts. And uh, he had a complete reconstruction of the lower eyelid. That's his normal eye. That's his own eye, and he can see very well. Uh, he's improved now. The only thing looks like he might have had some acne at one time. Uh, all of the scarring has uh, improved greatly. Uh, this uh, is a very typical use of, uh, or indication for the hyperbaric chamber. This is the old diabetic who's just had a, uh, a cabbage. Uh, a coronary artery bypass surgery. They've harvested veins from the leg, and here the veins, uh, the harvest sites, have failed to heal. This man was referred from another city where 
Um, despite uh, excellent wound care, every time they debrided uh, the harvest, vein harvest site, the wounds just got bigger. And he was contemplating suicide because he did not want to lose his legs. This was a bilateral condition. This just shows one side. He was eventually shipped here uh, and started in the chamber. We're getting a little richer color here now after hyperbarics has started. Uh, exuberant granulation tissue is starting. And uh, we're getting a base for a graft started. Here the graft has been applied. And finally, uh, the grafting was complete. And he saved uh, both lower limbs. Trauma. <clears throat> this is an area where we can be of help when there has been compromise of, of uh, tissue, uh, blood supply, or where there's been some edema or swelling. Uh, here we have a situation where we have a nose that has been just about removed completely um, by windshield injury. Uh, here the, uh, there's just a little tab of tissue holding the nose on. So we have uh, now a composite graft. In other words, there's cartilage, bone, skin, muscle uh, in the graft. And when you have a composite graft, of that size with no vascular hook-ons, you generally get a loss of the graft. Uh, the surgeon reapproximated it uh, in the emergency room at a local hospital and then referred the patient to us immediately. As he left the emergency room, literally with his gloved hand, he picked up the phone and referred the patient to us. We cannot do anything for these patients if we get them three days later and everything is blue. We want to see these patients, well, the crush injuries, the industrial injuries, within hours or as soon as they're out of the operating room that's when we can go to work this is after one treatment i don't like the looks of the nose it's kind of blue but uh, we treated again now it's looking a lot better we treated him about uh, 13 times in the first six days and then we stopped the nose is on and this is a picture taken at 13 days after the injury all the sutures are out the nose is on fully uh, this man we saw too late. Uh, he had a crush injury, 4,000 pounds of steel landed on his foot. He was brought to our emergency room. A physician who was not familiar with the chamber saw him, simply sent him upstairs with some gauze between his toes with elevation. Uh, nine days later, a second orthopedist was consulted, uh, referred the patient to us, and uh, within 15 minutes, we had him in the chamber. All at this, we hoped at this time all we could do was, would be to uh, help demarcate uh, his transmitted tarsal amputation. We felt that a transmitted tarsal was the only thing that was uh, going to save, uh, going to heal here. Uh, to our surprise, after uh, about seven days of hyperbaric oxygen, we breeded it down and found excellent uh, red tissue underneath. And he saved the proximal phalanx of his great toe, so we can push off with that. At this point, uh, he was grafted with 100% take of the graft. This man uh, ran his fingers into a roll, uh, steel rolling press uh, at a local manufacturing company. The, the rolls were set 54 thousandths of an inch apart. He ran his fingers up to the PIP joint. Uh, uh, when the uh, paramedics arrived, they were disassembling the machine to take his hand out because they could not roll it backward. Uh, this shows an x-ray. Here you'll see the uh, fractures out here in the distal uh, digit. Uh, distal phalanx. Uh, he had all of, uh, of his uh, uh, fingers thoroughly squashed, but the amazing thing is he did not even lose his fingernails. We got him within uh, something like uh, four hours of injury. Uh, we stopped the edema and uh, he kept uh, all of his, uh, his fingers. Uh, edema reduction is remarkable because uh, uh, there are uh, Factors that go into play to, that, that go across the cell membrane. ATP uh, is preserved uh, and uh, the energy of the cell is preserved, so therefore it can control its own uh, ion exchange better. And Nilanda has demonstrated this, uh, and he's shown that you can reduce edema with hyperbaric treatment in an ischemic limb, to totally ischemic limb, globally ischemic, uh, by 50% with a p value of 0.001. Strauss and Hargens did a study of compartment syndrome in dogs where they raised the intercompartmental pressure in the dog uh, up to 100 millimeters of mercury by hanging up a bag of plasma and uh, letting the plasma run into the compartment. They maintained this compartment pressure of up to 100 millimeters of mercury measured by a wick catheter for up to eight hours. Okay, uh, they then compared these with control dogs to the contralateral limb. Uh, the dogs uh, were treated three times, the, the hyperbarically group, treated group, in 10 hours for uh, two, ATA, uh, two ATA for one hour. We probably would be more vigorous in a human being, but this was okay for the study. 
then the dogs were looked at using technetium-99 and some other uh, factors. They measured also the weights of the compartments. The edema was effectively reduced by weight at a p-value of 0 0.05. Hyperbaric did that. But this was the most amazing stuff. Uh, here is muscle necrosis as measured by technetium-99. Note here that uh, compartment pressure, this is the muscle necrosis for a compartment pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury for eight hours. And this is the, uh, uh, that's the control dog. And here is the treated dog under the same conditions. Notes are vast difference here in necrosis. Any orthopedist would tell you that 100 millimeters of mercury for eight hours uh, compartment pressure is a wipeout. The, the thing here to remember is if you see someone who you suspect you may have to do a fasciotomy on because of an impending compartment syndrome, that's the person who should be put into the hyperbaric chamber. You may be able to avoid doing the, the uh, fasciotomy. On the other hand, if you have to do a fasciotomy, continue with hyperbaric anyhow. It's an adjunct to fasciotomy and the swelling will be much reduced much faster and there'll be less scarring and disfiguring. This brings us end to uh, this discussion of wound healing where hyperbaric oxygen is used as an adjunct. I think the one point I'd like to make here, though, is that hyperbaric oxygen is adjunctive. You must also, at the same time, with all of these problem wounds, use good surgical care with medical support. Uh, this is uh, to say that hyperbaric oxygen usually is only one element in wound healing. Nevertheless, with the addition of hyperbaric oxygen used judiciously, you'll be able to salvage many wounds that previously would have been impossible to save. Thank you.